there are a few people you meet in your professional life or even your private life where you become a better person just by knowing them and affiliating with them. And Doug Johnston has been one of those for me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to spend time with him. Uh, the first time I met him, uh, it became clear that I wanted to do something with the Wheatley Institution that I have the honor to direct to engage his work and to be part of it. And so this conference is the fruition of that. And uh, it's uh, something I have looked forward to and it's uh, uh, to me uh, personally uh, very important. He's president, as you know, president and founder of the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy. He's had a distinguished career in the military. I, I am not surprised that he was the youngest officer in the Navy to be qualified for command of a nuclear submarine. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of stoicism and a certain kind of disposition to, to do that, I think. He's had uh, a career in the think tank world at uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's worked in government, in education, and uh, he is someone who, when he speaks, we need to uh, pay attention. It's a great privilege to have him with us. So it's my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce to you Dr. Douglas Johnston. Thank you, Richard. I'm uh, truly humbled by your very kind words. Uh, last night, you heard a splendid talk by Ibu Patel on the business of interfaith leadership. Now, that's something that our, our own center takes very seriously. And in fact, just a few weeks ago, we uh, launched a, an interfaith leadership network between Pakistan and the United States. And over the course of a week-long meeting in Nepal, which uh, James Patton headed for our, uh, our side of it, we brought together uh, interfaith and religious leaders from Pakistan and from the American evangelical community. And the whole idea is to try to work together to develop capacity uh, building initiatives that can uh, ease the plight of religious minorities in Pakistan and also on this side of the pond to uh, arrest the spread and impact of Islamophobia, which has taken root uh, more than it should, actually. So uh, what I want to talk to you about is a business called faith-based diplomacy. And for those of you who have uh, heard me talk about this before, I apologize for any redundancy with what you have already been exposed to. Uh, but for the rest of you, uh, you might find it uh, somewhat uh, unique. Um, first, let me get, set a backdrop for you. In, uh, <clears throat> in the Pentagon, for probably the last 25 years, uh, defense planners have been wrestling with uh, what's called the asymmetric threat. For those of you not familiar with that term, it usually connotes an attack by creative, unconventional means that a disadvantaged opponent uses against a more powerful adversary much like bin Laden did on 9-11 to rock this country back on its heels. And in response to that, the Pentagon came up with a new concept called irregular warfare. This was several years ago, which calls for a much tighter uh, integration of diplomacy, defense, and development, which is all to the good. But I maintain that uh, there's not enough money in Western treasuries to protect any single country against the full spectrum of possible asymmetric threats. And what you really need is an asymmetric counter to those asymmetric threat, a counter that gets at the ideas behind the guns, if you will. Now that sounds reasonably straightforward enough, but it's made more complicated by the religious nature of those ideas. And that's not good news for the United States. I think as Marianne Love uh, reminded us earlier this afternoon, you know, we uh, particularly based on our recent involvements in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, our country has very little ability to deal with religious differences in a hostile setting. 
nor do we have any ability to counter demagogues like bin Laden or before him Milosevic who manipulate religion for their own purposes. Uh, and I find it supremely ironic that one of the most religious nations on the face of the planet is so at sea and not knowing how to deal with these uh, religious imperatives. Uh, <clears throat> there are a number of reasons for that. Several that stand out are, first of all, is our long-held uh, commitment to separation of church and state <clears throat> since our birth. And that's fine, and I would not suggest that we do anything different. But we've unfortunately let it become an excuse for not doing our homework to understand how religion informs the worldviews and political aspirations of those who do not similarly separate the two. Second, and this uh, gets back to what Marianne said about uh, our, our Cold War structures, uh, uh, we have been long committed to the rational actor model of decision making, which has governed our practice of international relations for as long as I can remember, and which non-rational factors like religion are not on the policymaker screen. They're excluded. So we simply don't know how to deal with it. And finally are the political ambiguities surrounding our separation of church and state. It causes cause our political leaders and our military leaders to uh, shy away from addressing the religious dimensions of the threats that they're facing. And many of them are very intimidated by that. And it causes us to be out there fighting with one hand behind our back. One person who that generalization does not apply to, though, is General David Petraeus. <clears throat> he understood that if you've got a national security dimension and a secular purpose, there's all sorts of room to run. Uh, <clears throat> and if you watched him in his briefings before the Congress and, and the like, you know, very pronounced would be engage religious leaders. He got it. Now, I must say this, though, in all fairness, that we operate with double standards in lots of areas, but even internally, we operate with a double standard because you find the military can get away with repairing that mosque to develop good relations with the communities in which they're involved. Whereas if uh, USAID uh, tries to do the same thing, they're stopped cold by the lawyers. And this gets, it all has to do with these political ambiguities that I'm, that I'm talking about. So when you <clears throat> couple all of this with this looming specter of, you know, the overriding concern that all of us have, I think, of marrying religious extremism with weapons of mass destruction, it just adds to the urgency for why we need to fill this gap. Well, one approach that has shown unusual promise here is this business of faith-based diplomacy. Now, what is it at the macro level? It uh, simply means incorporating religious considerations into our practice of international politics. The micro level, it means actually making religion part of the solution in some of these intractable identity-based conflicts, ethnic conflicts, tribal warfare, religious hostilities, the kinds of things that exceed the grasp of traditional diplomacy. And if you want to uh, read more about it, you can, uh, <coughs> you've all been given this book, and it's, uh, it goes into it in some detail in there. But <clears throat> since you have been given the book, I want to tell you just a little bit about it to hopefully inspire you to read it. Uh, it's really a how-to book. It's how to incorporate religious considerations into the practice of U.S. foreign policy, where it would be considered on a daily basis in the natural course of things. Uh, second, it's a how-to book on how to get past the rational actor model to a process that not only accommodates non-state actors, but also non-rational factors like religion. And then finally, it's a how-to book in, in how we can move to a different leadership paradigm that will serve our country better, I think, in the multipolar world that we are now entering. And if I had to give that a bumper sticker character, characterization, it would be servant leadership at the international level, where you lead more by example than by force. Uh, <clears throat> so the book itself uh, goes in. Let, let me just read from the uh, one 
actually a couple sentences from the forward by uh, retired Marine Corps General Anthony Zinni, who served as uh, our uh, Commander-in-Chief of Central Command, which uh, is fighting our wars over there, uh, and also was U.S. Special Envoy to the Middle East. Here's what he says. He says, this is a visionary approach that goes beyond the whole of government effort and which expands the current definition of smart power. From my two decades of experience in the Islamic world, I am convinced that the vast majority of Muslims would embrace this approach as a means of clearly expressing their beliefs and enabling them to understand ours. So <clears throat> the other thing I think that's uh, interesting about the book is uh, sort of hypothetically asked myself, what would I do if I were king for a day? <clears throat> what resources do we currently have at our disposal that could be usefully redirected to addressing this kind of problem? And <clears throat> Beyond that, what additional capabilities might we need? Well, when you look at the things that we have available, there's uh, three in number. Uh, first, and this has been mentioned earlier, uh, military chaplains. <coughs> and back in 2001, this is before 9-11, uh, I had the good fortune to lead a team of four folks uh, Dick Ruffin was uh, one of them, uh, and, and the star of our show, I believe. I don't see Dick here, but he, I know he's here somewhere. But Dick, uh, <coughs> Dick and I and a couple of others went around and we trained all Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and Navy chaplains in uh, religion and statecraft. And the U.S. Navy bought all of them a copy of that first book, which came out in 94, called Religion, the Missing Dimension of Statecraft. 1,300 copies, so it was good for book sales, but, <coughs> but uh, the, um, as we went around the world training all these folks, it was very interesting to, to watch them, and we, it, it was about a four-day effort, and it largely, if I had to encapsulate it, I would just say that we were really looking at all the benefits that could flow from military chaplains establishing relationships of trust with local clergy, wherever they might be stationed. Now, why the Navy was doing this is because we're trying to enhance the conflict prevention capabilities of the sea service commands, which are on the cutting edge of our overseas involvements, okay? And <clears throat> as we went through this, we found, and I guess this would not be any surprise, <coughs> but about a third of the military chaplains were very keen to take on this sort of thing, where they could actually be helping to prevent the conflict rather than being relegated to picking up the pieces after conflict has, has occurred. Um, I had a good friend who was a military chaplain who hit the, he's now deceased, but, but he uh, hit the beach at Guadalcanal and there were eight military chaplains that, that did that. He was the only one that, that lived. So, you know, it's, a, it's very tough and it's, it's it just makes so much more sense to devote as much energy as you can on the prevention side. Um, <clears throat> I remember, and Dick will remember this too, uh, uh, talking to one Marine general as we were doing this, and he pounds his ta hand on the table and he says, you know, he says, the only responsibility of my chaplains is to attend to the spiritual needs of the men and women of my command, period. You know, it's very emphatic about it. So it was not an easy sell. but over time, and we did other things, we wrote articles trying to challenge the, the line officer community to expand the rules of engagement for chaplains so that they could engage in this sort of activity, those who want to do it and those who got trained to do it. And uh, in the last uh, revision of the joint publication 105, which governs uh, what the chaplains can do in joint operations, it, uh, it got us 95% of the way there. There's a lot of latitude now. There's still a long way to go. The services still haven't uh, developed the subspecialties and the training for it to make it all happen, but it's on its way. The second thing are NGOs, and, which is what we are, and I'll talk more about that momentarily. But the third, and I think uh, this is very important for all of you to think about, is the American Muslim community. Uh, it struck me very early on after 9-11 that probably the most strategic asset that we had at our disposal in this global contest with militant Islam was the American Muslim community. 
Not only were we not recognizing it as such, but we were unwittingly alienating as we went on. So in 2006, we convened a meeting of 30 American Muslim religious leaders with 30 uh, uh, U.S. government practitioners, security officials, foreign policy practitioners, and the like. And we did this in, uh, we co-sponsored this with the International Institute of Islamic Thought, which is headquartered in Herndon, Virginia, but also the Institute for Defense Analyses, which is the Pentagon's leading think tank. And, and the whole idea was to see how we could get the American Muslim community and the U.S. government working together for the common good. And we had uh, four specific goals. Uh, first was how could we address the leg legitimate grievances that the community had. Second was how could we <clears throat> capitalize on the extensive paths of influence that, the, that this community has with Muslim communities overseas, many of them in countries of great strategic consequence to us. Uh, third was how, how could we uh, impart a Muslim perspective and understanding to U.S. foreign policy and public diplomacy. If you recall back in the Cold War, one of the things we did uh, uh, quite often, almost all the time in fact, was put on a Soviet hat and try to look at the situation through their side of the prism and, uh, and figure out what we would need to do to counter how they were going to counter us. We've done none of that with respect to this. We, you know, trying to get to... So one of the things that came out of this, uh, we, we had a conference the, the following year to keep, make sure we had accountability for the recommendations that had flowed out of the first conference and to come up with more ideas as well. And now in the specific project area, one of the things that happened is I'm pleased to say that the doors at Departments of State, Defense, Homeland Security, and Justice open much wider to the inputs of American Muslim citizens. Um, and um, one of the things on the Muslim side they did is they uh, uh, formed a group called American Muslims for Constructive Engagement where they're deliberately doing, uh, determining how they can help serve the U.S. national interest. And we, uh, about every month and a half on Capitol Hill, we co-sponsor a policy forum uh, where we bring together key congressional staff with key executive branch staff and key uh, uh, Muslim uh, representatives of the American Muslim community and outside experts. And unlike other presentations on the Hill where you have uh, somebody who lectures or gives a talk and then you have questions and answers. This is very different. We start with uh, one of the policy makers uh, and, and really it's the staff that make the policy, it's not the con congressional members, uh, <clears throat> to sort of open with the kinds of problems they're wrestling with with relation to the topic at hand. And usually it's been a country focus, whether it's Egypt or Bahrain or Libya or what have you. Last one was terrorism in the Horn of Africa. Uh, but uh, what happens is that uh, it's just a very rich discussion over lunch, hour and a half discussion, and everybody, myself included, comes away much better informed than when they went in. And I remembered how surprised I was uh, two times ago when we were addressing Afghanistan. And I came away far more encouraged about Afghanistan than when I walked in. Because one of the things I hadn't quite realized, and you don't pick up on this in the media, and if there were one lesson I'd like you to take away tonight, is always be a bit skeptical about what you read in the media. <laughs> but <clears throat> no news there. But uh, they, uh, the youth, the folks your age in uh, Afghanistan, many of them, the, the Taliban is just a distant memory, if they remember it at all. And so they've been very encouraged by all of the uh, uh, progress that's been made over the last 12 years, and they're very excited about the upcoming elections and all the rest of it. So, you know, I'm very hopeful that uh, the U.S. can find its way clear to uh, conclude this security agreement with Afghanistan, because I think there's a lot of good to build upon there. And uh, we risk throwing away all that we fought for if we don't have that continuing relationship. So um, then the final uh, 
goal of that conference was to see what we could do to uh, help support the American Muslim community in taking a strong leadership role in the further uh, advancement of Islam, both intellectually and spiritually. And it's kind of interesting when I've tried that idea out on high-level Muslims in different parts of the world, Malaysia and elsewhere, um, they're very uh, sympathetic with it. And in fact, there's an undercurrent that the sun, S-U-N, of Islam is going to rise in the West. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it because the American Muslim community on a daily basis is bridging modernity and the contemporary practice of Islam. And furthermore, they probably have more freedom of thought than just about any Muslim community uh, in the world. So with those assets, they can play a huge role. Now, in terms of things that, new things that need to be done, one is addressing the, the political ambiguities business that I spoke about. It could, very, it could be addressed very easily if the president were to task his Justice Department with building the legal case for uh, incorporating religious engagement into the practice of U.S. foreign policy and then getting high-level bipartisan support on Capitol Hill for it. Then you would free up the creative energies of all these people who are now semi-paralyzed, you know, afraid to act because they you know, they, they fear what might happen to their careers. So that's one thing. The second thing is <clears throat> doing some realigning of the executive branch, particularly the State Department. In the book, you'll see four alternative structures for how that might be accomplished so that, uh, you know, the, that religion does get considered in the real practice on a daily basis. Uh, one item I would mention there, uh, uh, which I've been advocating for a long time now, is to establish a specialty within the uh, Foreign Service uh, called religion attache, a new position. Uh, when you talk to people who are in the State Department and all, uh, some might be receptive to that, but the naysayers will tell you that's the quickest way to marginalize something is by you know, uh, uh, creating a specialty around it. And I think that's uh, balderdash. I don't believe it for a second because if you took these folks, now these would be folks who understand how faith motivates action. And they would be uh, grounded in, you know, they might have some seminary background. They could be, these could be contracted in. We've, we've determined that a cadre of as few as 30 could handle our global interests because we're talking about only uh, um, posting these, these new positions in countries where religion has particular salience or it's Saudi Arabia or Israel or you name it. And, um, and it would be an annual cost of $10 million, which may sound like a lot, but it pales in comparison to the billions of dollars we spend on, on uh, symptoms, you know, baggage handlers, all the rest of that. But uh, if we could get it caused, because what typically happens now is religious issues are handled either by the cultural affairs officer, the political officer, or the ambassador, him or herself. And all too often, these complex, a lot of them are very complex issues, they get pushed aside by more pressing business. So if you had somebody who was equipped to deal with these kinds of issues and who was appropriately positioned within the political section of the uh, embassy staff, just like political military officers are, I think it could work just fine. Uh, so that's, that's one thing there. Um, Another piece would be to try to um, bring to life a real conflict prevention capability. And one of the chapters in there is devoted to the con a concept of conflict prevention research teams that would be comprised of individuals, civilians, with the right disciplines, depending on what area you're looking at. Uh, for example, in the Balkans, if you were to go into Bosnia, you'll find that everything looks wonderful. Uh, Sarajevo has been rebuilt, a cosmopolitan city, everything. But just beneath the surface, the tensions are still as severe as they were when the war was in, in place. So these sorts of, you know, if you send teams in to sort of see what's going on uh, before things heat up, and then come back with policy recommendations 
I think, uh, you know, it's that ounce of prevention worth the pound of cure. Uh, it's just so much, makes so much more sense. And the last piece, and this gets to the NGO thing, is uh, what I call organic suasion, where you try to promote peace from within. And to illustrate that, I'd just like to talk to you about our involvement in Pakistan. Since, since our inception back in 1999, we've, uh, we've been involved in the north of Sudan, uh, Kashmir, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and most recently Colombia, in addition to the United States. But in Pakistan, we spent seven years on the ground reforming the madrasas, the religious schools. Now, few in the West are mindful of the illustrious history of these schools. But back in the Middle Ages, up through the 16th century, they were without peer as institutions of higher learning in the world at the time. It was only European exposure to them that led to our own university system. And you would be stunned at how many of the traditions and mores of academe trace their roots to the madrasas, from the mortar boards and tassels you wear at graduation to funding a chair in a given discipline. It just goes on and on and on, and it shouldn't be a surprise because they were the models. We've just forgotten about it. Well, though they were in that, at the, the absolute peak of learning excellence, under the impact of colonialism, uh, particularly British colonialism, where attempts were made to try to secularize these schools, they reacted by purging themselves of all disciplines that were either Western in nature or secular in nature, to the point where the majority of them today are about rote memorization of the Quran and the study of Islamic principles. Now, our goals there have been twofold. First is to expand the curriculums to uh, include the physical and social sciences, but with a very strong emphasis on human rights, particularly women's rights, and religious tolerance. Now, when you, at, you run into people at USAID and the like, they will say, you know what these madrasas need are science, computers, English, and math. And I say, well, that's fine if you want to build more efficient terrorists. <laughs> you, you know, what you really need, you, you, you've got to have this human rights and the religious tolerance. And that's, what, that's been our strongest focus. We don't deny the other at all. We promote it. But it's got to be couched in, in this other language. And uh, thus far, uh, at, at, over those seven years, we engaged some 2,700 madrasa leaders from some 1,600 madrasas. Sounds like a lot. It's not. There are 20,000. But all the ones we did were in the more radical areas of the country. So we feel there's sufficient momentum to take this across the board. Now, why, did we, why were we successful when no one else had been, least of all the government of Pakistan? Several reasons. First was ownership. We conducted the project in such a way that the madrasa leaders felt it was their reform effort and not something imposed from the outside. And by the way, over, over there, we didn't use the word reform, we used the word enhance. And en enhancement really works when you consider their history. You know? So, <clears throat> um, if you, again, this gets back to the media. I've been instructed to speak close to the mic here, so I'll try to do that. But if you read the media and read about madrasas, all you conclude is they're seedbeds of terrorism uh, with sort of a caveman mentality associated with them. <clears throat> and I don't think that's a very accurate portrayal. What I'd like to do is I'd like to read you a very short paragraph. from It's the introductory paragraph on the teacher awareness module of the uh, workshops that we conducted with these madrasa leaders. And this was crafted by a madrasa leader. I quote, <clears throat> I've come to a frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. My personal approach creates the climate. My daily mood makes the weather. As a teacher, I have a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it's my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. That's very powerful. I would be hard-pressed to come up with something half that good myself. The second, <clears throat> we've inspired them with their own heritage, not only the heritage of their own schools, but going back to the very origins of Islam, 
on so many of the pioneering breakthroughs in the arts and science, including religious tolerance, took place under Islam. And the more they hear this, uh, internalize it, the taller they walk and start thinking, hey, maybe we can do better too. And the third reason, and I think this is probably most important of all, is we ground all suggested change in Islamic principles so they feel they're becoming better Muslims in the process, and they are. And the final one is that something I don't talk about much, when I do it, it sort of blows them away, but <clears throat> we operate from a posture of total humility, driven by our awareness that it was the United States that was very complicit in planting the seeds of jihad in the madrasas in the first place. We were trying to grow holy warriors to evict the godless Soviets out of Afghanistan. Soviets left, then we left, now we're back, they're doing what we trained them to do, they just changed targets. This is a, a very a, a glowing example of the law of unintended consequences, but here we are. I don't know how many of you may have seen the movie Charlie Wilson's War, which is a very accurate portrayal of really what happened, uh, but if you haven't, you should. It's, it's well worth seeing. <clears throat> now what I'd like to do is <clears throat> just illustrate with a few anecdotes give you a feel for the faith-based diplomacy part of it. At one point, probably about eight years ago, um, I took a couple of board members over to Pakistan and we visited several madrasas that had been clearly identified with terrorism. The first one was a Diobandi madrasa outside of Karachi. Now, <clears throat> there are five sects that sponsor these schools. Diobandis and the Wahhabis are the hardest line. Uh, and then you have the Barelvis and the Shia and the Jamaat Islami. Uh, but the Diobandis, which is where the Taliban comes out of, are far more powerful and influential than all the other four put together. So we were visiting a very major uh, Diobandi madrasa outside Karachi that was uh, known to supply most of the fighters for Kashmir and Chechnya and uh, also had spawned the two most violent anti-Shia terrorist groups. Walk into a room, it was about this size, and it's full of uh, madrasa leaders and uh, uh, seasoned Islamic scholars and the like, uh, and it was full of rage. Rage uh, over U.S. foreign policy more generally, but also rage because at that time uh, Israel and Hezbollah were locked in combat in Lebanon. And anything Israel does, the United States gets credit for. So to try to break through that, I said, look, we're, we're not a government organization, nor have we uh, ever received any funding from our government, which was true at that time. I said, and uh, while you may, while the United States may have made some mistakes of late, it's important for you to remember when they have uh, intervened on behalf of Muslims in Bosnia, Kosovo, Somalia, Kuwait, and I uh, said, while they, you may fairly criticize the United States for operating with a double standard in the Middle East because of its strategic relationship with Israel, I said, so too can you criticize the Arab leaders who, you know, complain mightily of Israeli mistreatment but then turn a deaf ear to Palestinian pleas for humanitarian assistance. So I said, anywhere you look, there are double standards driven by perceived national self-interest. I said, but that's not why we're here. We're here to see if we can build on commonly shared religious values that bring us closer together. And then I uh, recited uh, three passages from the Quran that I had committed to memory, not, not in Urdu, but in English, and it was translated. But the a consolidated paraphrase would be, uh, and you, you've all heard this at one time or another, but it's, oh, mankind, God could have made you one had he willed, but he did not. He made you into separate nations and tribes that you may know one another, cooperate with one another, and compete with one another in good works. I said, I and my two colleagues are here to open the competition in good works. And I said, uh, <clears throat> the three of us happen to be followers of Jesus. And I said, and we know you cannot be a good Muslim without believing some pretty wonderful things about Jesus, which is very true, and we can go into that in, in depth. But I said, uh, Let's ask ourselves, how would he want us to behave toward one another 
were he in our midst today. And over the course of an hour, at the end of the hour, the discussion segued into kind of a little social gathering with punch and cookies and all, but the, the rage had genuinely been converted to a spirit of a total acceptance, if not fellowship. It was amazing to behold. And one of the things my, our project director told me uh, some months later, he said that in each case where we did this, and each time that I, uh, you know, recited these passages from the Quran, he says he heard a, you know, it was a, an audible sigh of relief in the, in the, the audience. It was as though the, the rage was being defused because, you know, people were interpreting this not as tolerance, but as respect. There's a big difference. We throw that word tolerance, and I'm as guilty as anybody around a lot, but it's really respect that you need to get to, where people know that you care enough about them and the values they hold dear to learn about them. So that's a, it's, that's a great takeaway for you. Uh, but we then went up to a, a Wahhabi madrasa outside Lahore that had been identified with the London bombers. Exact same presentation, same results. And interesting, in the wake of that, the madrasa leader, who was a very big, uh, revered and somewhat feared individual uh, had run, in, ran into our project director, uh, I'll talk more about him momentarily, uh, on several occasions. And each time he brought up that question about Jesus, and he says, it has caused me to ask myself on a daily basis, what would the prophet have me do? And uh, that madrasa, without the benefit of our workshops, we, they, they've wanted them, we had never, never made it up there, but they've been sponsoring seminars on uh, conflict resolution and peacemaking. So you never quite know uh, where these seeds are going to, to uh, bear fruit. And uh, in, in the third one that we went to, uh, it was a very interesting episode. A madrasa leader comes up at the end, and uh, one of them says, uh, he has his hand over his heart, and he says, you have made me so very, very happy. He says, we thought all Americans hated us. And I thought to myself, well, if you read the media, that's the impression you would get. But you know, I assured him that was not the case. Uh, but another madrasa leader came up and he said, you know, there's a situation in our village, he said, uh, in which a young woman was caught talking on her cell phone <clears throat> at 2 o'clock in the morning to a young man in an adjacent village in whom she had an interest. And the village elders thought this violated their code of honor. So she was to die, and the boy was to lose his nose and his ears. And so this madrasa leader said, and he was a fairly young man, he says, ordinarily I would not get involved. He says, but after our discussions on human rights, I feel compelled to go challenge this on religious grounds. So he did with some trepidation, because uh, like I say, he was pretty young and he was going up against the village elders. But he went there with open Quran and pointed out how there was nothing in the Quran that prohibited women from talking to men. And he also urged the uh, peaceful resolution of differences that many passages uh, uh, encourage. And he pulled it off. Nobody was hurt. The thing was resolved. And hopefully that can be a precedent for that village and perhaps other village around, uh, villages around it. But this was a case where religion trumped tribalism in a context in which most Muslims can't tell you where one ends and the other begins. And I will tell you this, that so much of the bad rap, a lot of the bad rap that Islam gets uh, is really tribalism and has nothing to do with religion. Uh, and it's not always a given that religion's always going to trump, because as they will point out to you, their tribal customs date back 3,000 years. Islam's only 1,400 years. So you have to work at it, basically. Now, another situation. Uh, in one of our workshops, uh, one of the participants was a Taliban commander of some renown. And we were su surprised. Uh, we always partner with indigenous uh, folks to help, you know, uh, t hit the ground running so we don't have to build credibility from scratch. But we partner with organizations or people who already command the respect and credibility with the folks we need to reach. 
And so, in this case, uh, it was a Taliban commander who had been recruited by our partners. And, and he shared with our project director, and he was very despondent. He lost two sons in the fighting. He says, you know, we don't know what America wants. And uh, uh, he says, you, you come after us with guns, we have no recourse but to respond in kind. So this led to an invitation for me to come to the mountains to meet with their senior leadership to tell them what America wants, which I did two months later. In the interim, I made the rounds at state defense and this agency to, to make sure whatever I said was consistent with U.S. policy. And so I find myself again in a room about this size uh, in a compound up in the uh, Malakand Agency, which is the northwest frontier of Pakistan, up in the mountains, pretty near the Swat Valley, and uh, right across the border from Nuristan, which is uh, in Afghanistan. And most of these were Afghan uh, commanders who had been brought across the border for this meeting. Uh, Fifty-seven Taliban commanders, several tribal and religious leaders, and it was uh, obvious by the looks on some of their faces that some of them were less pleased to be there than others. Uh, but uh, I told them, I gave them the, the business about not being a government organization. I said, you know, and frankly, if our government had its way, this meeting would never take place. I'm just trying to disabuse them of any uh, feelings that we controlled what our government did. And, and uh, I said, why we're here is to see if we can build on religious values we share in common to develop a confidence-building measure that can point toward peace. I said, but to do that, you need to understand the Western perspective on what's going on here. So I told them what America wanted was for them to lay down their arms, distance themselves from Al-Qaeda, and to reconcile with the Karzai government. And then we went into about two and a half hours of dialogue. A lot of venting took place, as you might imagine. Um, and there were a number of penetrating questions that emerged. I'll just share two of them with you. One was, what do the American people want? And with that, I <coughs> breathe a sigh of relief because it meant they were still cutting us some slack even though we had re-elected the administration that was causing all their problems. And <clears throat> but then the other one was, why are you attacking Afghanistan? I said, well, to put this in terms that you hold dear, hospitality, loyalty, and revenge, and that really, those are the driving factors. <clears throat> I said, before we recognize certain members of Al-Qaeda as a threat, we welcome them into our country. We gave them hospitality, and then without warning, on 9-11, they struck. I said, we wanted revenge. So we went to the Taliban government, asked them to turn over the Al-Qaeda leadership so we could bring them to justice. They refused, so we attacked. I said, but we did so with a heavy heart, because most Americans have great admiration and respect for the Afghan people stemming from our common struggle against the former Soviet Union. And so furthermore, I said, you've got to recognize that your tribal leaders are now banding together against Al-Qaeda because they violated your hospitality. So then we, you know, after the two and a half hours, we, we broke for prayer and um, came back in a smaller group and came up with a confidence building measure. Uh, in the course of that two and a half hour dialogue, uh, at one point, one gentleman, uh, by the way, I learned later that some of these folks were Al-Qaeda, and I didn't know it, and I'm glad I didn't know it. Uh, but this very rough looking guy stands up and he points his finger at me, he says, he says, I can't talk to you unless you become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. and so I said, well, I really don't see a problem. Muslim means submission to God. We all submit to God, therefore we're all Muslims. Everybody laughed and we went on with our show. <laughs> and, and later on, uh, later on, my project director told me that he and our Wahhabi partner who had spent better part of a month rounding these folks up, got very uptight because that scenario is often you convert or you die. And of course, I was totally oblivious to all that, and I thought to myself, <laughs> I thought to myself, you know, the Lord really does look out for fools and incompetence. So. <laughs> but, uh, but we came up with this confidence building measure, and I won't go into detail on what it was, but it failed because I was unable to get NATO concurrence to do what they would have to do to help make it happen. But where it did bear fruit was three months later when the Korean ambassador called me and asked if there was anything our center could do to 
to help secure the release of the 21 Korean missionaries being held hostage by the Taliban. And because of the networking associated with that first meeting in the mountains, we were ultimately able to play an instrumental role in getting those uh, uh, missionaries freed. It's a fascinating story. We don't have time to go into it here, maybe in the questions and answers, but, but you just, like I say, you never know. Now, two other very quick anecdotes to seal this off. Um, in one workshop in the Punjab, this was known to be an Al-Qaeda feeder. 22% of the graduates on average went into Al-Qaeda. But they didn't go to Afghanistan to fight Americans. They went up to, because of their geometric, uh, geographic proximity, they went to Kashmir to be part of the militant movement there. Uh, but towards the end of the workshop, um, one of the uh, madrasa leaders said, is uh, waging conflict in Kashmir sanctioned by Islam? And uh, our project director said, no. He says, but I'm not a religious leader. So he turned to our Wahhabi partner who enjoyed at least honorary mullah status. And he says, no. He says, only to defend the faith, never to acquire territory. Well, this then led to a very uh, sometimes heated discussion of debate between the madrasa leaders. And they finally came up with a consensus conclusion that the fighting in Kashmir was politically motivated but not religiously sanctioned. So then they started thinking about, you know, how can we tone down the militancy of our graduates? And, uh, you know, this gets that ideas behind the guns business I was talking about. And I was surprised uh, two trips later to find that, the, that that episode had been carried in the newspapers all the way over in Baluchistan, which is half the country away. It was really amazing how fast it travels. But the final one, and here again, I think this probably illustrates better than any the ideas behind the guns theme. Uh, back when the Taliban had taken over the Swat Valley and lots of heads were rolling, in the Swat Valley, if some of you don't remember, is kind of a resort area up in the mountains of Pakistan uh, and a very nice place, but not when the Taliban took over. Uh, and so we were having a workshop for 16 madrasas surrounding the Swat Valley. And um, toward, the, uh, toward the end, a madrasa leader stood up and it turned out he was not only a madrasa leader, he was a terrorist commander in Lashkari Taiba, the folks who brought you Mumbai. And he said, I came here for one reason and one reason only, it's to discredit everything you have to say. He said, but now I find myself standing here full of rage. Rage because for 26 years I have taught studied and taught the Quran the way it was taught to me. He says, for the first time in my life, I feel I have now sensed the soul of the Holy Quran and its peaceful intent. He said, I now see that the right way to advance Islam is through peace and not through conflict. I'm going to change what I teach my students and I'm going to tell them why. Well, we came back a month later and he was doing exactly as he promised. And there was, we had a CNN team in tow. And they, uh, you know, they'd been after us for three years to document our work. So we had him alone. And he said it on CNN for God and the entire world to hear, you know. And I guess he got away with it because he was a terrorist commander, but even he finally realized he was on thin ice. He said, enough, enough. You know, so, uh, but uh, this just, it, you know, here's somebody who is a madrasa leader who has been studying and teaching the Quran for 26 years. And yet, you know, the idea, it, it's sort of like any of our holy scriptures. You can find just about references to justify just about anything you want to. And so if you're looking to, with a hostile intent, you will overlook the passages or just skim them. But he finally looked at them and he changed his tune. Well, these are all anecdotes, just to give you a feel for the flavor. Uh, systemically, we did some things as well. One of the things we tried to do was to bring the government and the madrasa leaders uh, closer together. There's a thing called the National Madrasa Oversight Board, five religious leaders that sit on the five sects that sponsor the schools. Uh, there's a deep distrust between the two, primarily because the government never delivers on its promises. 
And I don't think that's accidental. Uh, one of the, the elephant in the room nobody talks about in Pakistan is it's a feudal country. And the people on the top are absolutely not interested in empowering the people on the bottom. They want them to stay there. And in fact, they're, you know, I don't think it's uh, uh, an accident that Pakistan has one of the lowest percentages of GDP in the entire world devoted to education. And the illiteracy is very high. And when they're illiterate, they can't vote. So, you know, this is one of the things we're up against. Uh, and um, <clears throat> I think that the, um, I'm trying to recapture my thought here. But uh, on the, uh, when you look at the end game of all this, and where it's going to come out. Um, I think that you have to really realize that there's only so much you can do, uh, but bombs and the bullets are not the way to drain the swamp of extremism. They have their place, but if you really want to do it, you have to win hearts and minds. And one of the things I now remember what I was going to say, one of the things we did in trying to develop a model curriculum for the madrasas was we took that National Madrasa Oversight Board to Turkey and Egypt to expose them to how they deal with Islamic education. And they went with a bit of an attitude. You know, what can these secularists teach us religious purists? They came back very humble because what they found was that Egyptian and Turkish students could handle religious questions every bit as ably as uh, any Pakistani madrasa student. But they uh, also could handle contemporary problems because they'd had these other subjects. And they both, both countries offered to help the Madrasa Oversight Board with its uh, challenge of bringing these madrasas into the 21st century. And they made as a condition of their willingness to help that they would teach about other religions and other sects. So, I, I, you know, when, you, when Muslims hear that from Muslims, it really goes a long way. Now, <clears throat> just to, to end all this, uh, at one point, I, was, I told you I was going to tell you about our, our project leader. His name is Azar Hussein. And uh, Ozzy was a really uh, incredibly capable fellow. When I met him, before I hired him, he was a diversity trainer at AARP mm -hmm. of all places. But he had spent his youth in Karachi, had attended a madrasa, best trainer I've ever seen, truly. And uh, one of the most likable people on the face of the planet. So that combination was like a hot knife cutting through butter. And uh, he was really a, a hero twice over. Not only did he bear the burden of being an American, but he's also Shia. And where we were doing business, they do unmentionable things to Shia. And uh, fortunately, he was so likable by the time they figured out he was Shia that nobody wanted to hurt him, you know. So, so he had friends everywhere. And, and, you know, our work was very dangerous. And uh, sometimes you'd get calls that people were laying and waiting for you. And so you'd make alternative arrangements. But, but uh, then what happened is later on, I sat down with him one day and I said, look, I said, from this day forward, I don't want to ever mention our center's name in Pakistan again. I said, we're too widely known and we're too uh, targeted. I couldn't believe the timing, but three days later, out comes a seven-page online jihadist journal article uh, going to all the cells in Pakistan and Afghanistan, specifically targeting our work. So the good news is we were having an impact. The bad news is we're having an impact. And so our, our partners over there, one was Diobandi, the other was Wahhabi, who were absolutely fearless in taking us into the most difficult places. But when this article came out, they fled the country. And uh, they're back now. And what we did in response to this unwa unwanted publicity 
was fortunately two years earlier we had laid the uh, legal framework uh, for a, an indigenous NGO that we would one day staff up and pass the baton to because our job is always to work ourselves out of a job by creating capacity, not dependency. And uh, so we, we did that. We energized it, staffed it up, let Ozzy go. He was also our senior vice president for operations, uh, made him the president of that. He moved with his family to Dubai, where they're only an hour uh, flight away. Too dangerous for them to live in Pakistan. But we found some good space in a discreet area, and uh, the beat goes on. And one of the really nice things is that the State Department, who had actually been opposing our work for five years, never could quite figure it out. I think it had to do with church-state separation business, but we never could get a straight answer. But they finally came around, and they put up a half a million dollars to support the project work of this indigenous NGO, because they finally figured out that you know, what we were doing with the madrasas was every bit as strategic as anything else taking place on or off the battlefield. And so, you know, again, it gets to how do you drain the swamp. So, uh, with that, I'd like to just close and invite your questions. Thank you. It wasn't that good. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, at the interstate level, it seems like this faith-based faith diplomacy approach would be very useful in dealing with the diet of Israel and Iran, because for differing reasons, uh, both countries conceive of their national identities in ways that are deeply grounded in religiosity uh, as well. And so I'm curious if you were to have a year of John Kerry for a, a particularly long elevator ride, what would your elevator pitch be for integrating this kind of uh, logic of faith-based diplomacy into dealing with a more interest-based uh, diplomacy that predominates that situation? Who was in the elevator with me? John Kerry. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to give him an easy one, like Ahmadinejad or <laughs> Rouhani or somebody like say, that. Uh, Rouhani and Netanyahu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the ironies is that uh, uh, before the Shah, those two countries were quite close. Uh, and I think one of the problems was when Khomeini took over, uh, uh, he or one of his uh, family or close friends had been uh, tortured by and had remembered the fact that the instrument had been made in Israel or something like that, but it didn't take much. But, and one of the things, too, I would just uh, tell you is I, I had a, the opportunity to spend 10 days in Iran in 2003 as part of an Abrahamic delegation that was led by uh, Cardinal McCarrick, who was the Archbishop of Washington at the time. And it, it was uh, Abrahamic in that we had Christians and Muslims and Jews on, amongst the nine of us. There were nine of us. Went over there, we met with all the top leadership and uh, Grand Ayatollahs and what have you. Went all over the country uh, and I came away mightily impressed. Not with the theocracy, but the country itself. It's just, it's the legacy of the Persian Empire and the culture is just phenomenal. And you find that on average, not only is there widespread affection for Americans up and down, despite their, you know, Friday sermons condemning the great Satan, uh, even on the side of tall buildings in downtown Tehran, there are silhouettes of bombs dropping on the silhouette of the United States, you know, these murals. And, and so, but it sort of rolls right off their backs. There's widespread affection, but there's also, uh, they're all, they eulogize their poets. I mean, it's such a neat culture, and, and uh, they have great respect for... I've never seen so many philosophers in my life. If we had a group of Iranians like this, at least four of you would be philosophers, you know. And, and one of the things we never take into account, you know, when Ahmadinejad has make, made his bombastic claims about wiping Israel off the face of the earth, you know, you have to take that with a bit of a grain of salt. And what he was trying to do was politically to get out front of the Gulf states so that 
as they sought to become the regional hegemon that they would get some support there. Uh, but they know, I mean, the current foreign minister who I spent some time with when he was UN ambassador to, uh, he was Iran's ambassador to the UN, uh, is one of the most capable people I've ever met. And I think with him at the helm, we have a good chance of working through our problems with Iran. Uh, but he said, you know, we knew if we had nuclear weapons and stepped out of line, we'd be incinerated. And the thing that policymakers don't take into account is all these philosophers who infect a lot of other people, they love life. They're not suicidal, you know. And if uh, the other thing, too, that uh, I, th I think you, everyone should leave here with the idea that it's always useful to try to put on the other person's hat, try to see it through their side of the prism, and um, you know, make a concerted effort to do so. There's lots of wounds of history that get in the way, that sort of thing. But when you do that, uh, uh, you find it's a lot easier to engage. And, and typically, we often refuse to engage. And, and that serves no one's purposes. Uh, there's this uh, mindset that if we talk to them, somehow that's giving them added credibility when we really want to you know, replace them with better people. You know? So overtures, there were at least on two occasions when President Kotomi was in, who was a reform president, they approached the United States to lay everything on the table and try to talk it through. And how did we respond? We didn't respond. We didn't even give them the courtesy of a negative response. We just didn't respond. And, and those are opportunities that, uh, that are they're very f infrequent. And they should be taken advantage when the time comes. Because what happened? The reason we didn't respond was we wanted regime change. Well, we got regime change. We, we sort of discredited the reform regime and made way for the hardliners to come in, with whom we couldn't do business, you know. So back to your question. Um, sorry for being so long getting at it, but I think that uh, I think there would be room, uh, particularly based on what I know about the Iranians, to uh, uh, engage in faith-based diplomacy. In fact, we have in uh, we submitted it just two weeks ago, so it's very fresh. But we uh, have got a proposal in to bring uh, seven Iranian religious leaders together with seven Iraqi religious leaders together with seven American religious leaders, some of whom would be American Muslim religious leaders, and to uh, uh, come together as equals around the table dealing with a common problem. And the common problem in this case would be treat treatment of religious minorities. And on our side, it would be the Islamophobia business. But um, I think the planets may, we, we put this proposal in a year ago, it didn't fly, but I think the planets have now aligned such that something like this could fly. And our partner in this would be an outfit in another NGO, New York based, called Religions for Peace, the head of whom, uh, the head of which is uh, a gentleman by the name of Bill Venley, who's a close friend. But they are, they are more connected with religious leaders around the world than anybody else. Bar there's no close second. And in fact, it's not just religious leaders, because the current foreign minister, Javad Zarif, is a trustee of Religions for Peace. So we think we could really put something together and, and push things forward. But it's always, you know, when we get these requests for proposals from State Department and all, what they're really wanting you to do is to, is to do something where uh, you're teaching them how to do something better or different. When in fact, that will never work. People view that as patronizing. They don't want anything to do with it. So you have to be coming to the table as equal partners dealing with a common problem. That way, that'll fly. Yes, sir? What, what sort of barriers did you face being able to work with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda as, as an American-based NGO? Well, um, that's a very good question. Uh, we, we didn't actually. Uh, I would not claim that we worked with Al-Qaeda, but we certainly worked with the Taliban. And uh, the way that happened was uh, 
this was sheer opportunism, but I was uh, uh, briefing a friend of mine who had headed the Institute of Policy Studies in Islamabad. I told him, was telling him about our work in Kashmir at the time. And um, he mentioned in passing that they had just completed a major research project on the madrasas. And I showed a lot of interest in that. And on my way out the door, he said, how would you like to partner with us in reforming the madrasas? I said, would I? <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe he made that offer because this was after 9-11. And, um, and so we did, and what that meant was that I had to raise all the money. <laughs> and and uh, it also meant that, uh, you know, I, I was able to engage uh, Ozzy. Uh, I, I could only, I didn't have the money to hire him, so we'd take his vacation time, or I would pay AARP for a couple of weeks of his time. And, and he was right at the heart of the whole process of, you know, from day one. And, uh, after a year and a half, I got disillusioned because not only was our identity be, it was being kept covert because our partners there were fearful of, you know, being in partnership with Americans. Uh, the sect that they were identified with, Jamaat Islami, their anti-Western rhetoric wasn't toning down at all. And they were also only reforming the, the moderate madrasas. So we had an amicable parting of the ways, and uh, I think it was divine intervention, but the State Department called me up one day and said, we have a Diobandi Madrasa leader here in town, uh, would you like to meet with him? I said, yeah, absolutely. And so we had lunch the next day, and it turned out he was more than just a Madrasa leader. His family really had control over all 600 Diobandi Madrasas in Baluchistan, which is a very radical part of Pakistan. So he became an indigenous partner. And then the other one uh, also came from the State Department. Uh, ironically, he was the Wahhabi. And, and these guys, unlike the Policy Institute, uh, they were very brave. They said, look, we want people to know that we're partnering with Americans. Otherwise, all, they have, all people have is this negative stereotype, and it just leads to more violence. It's not good for our people. So they stuck with us through thick and thin, and one time it got very dicey when uh, uh, a madrasa was bombed. And uh, they were getting lots of pressure on them to cut and run. And uh, we finally put oil on the waters by, uh, I crafted a uh, piece that they ran in the local papers there about uh, how these were sacred institutions and should not be abused by being attacked militarily by anyone or by being misused by others for political purposes, you know, so. Uh, but that's kind of how we eased into it, and for the first year and a half, we were pretty covert. But the thing about Ozzy is he fits in, because he's Pakistani-American, and he, you know, though I raised the funds, though I got the project started, and though I went over, made a lot of visits to madrasas and to the president of the country and what have you, he was the tip of the spear. You know, he was the one that went into the really hard places. And I, I was on the, I, I remember one time I was in, when I had the two uh, board members with me, one of them was, uh, had been the first uh, commanding officer of SEAL Team 4, so it was good to have him along. But uh, we were <laughs> given this presentation in Abbottabad, uh, not knowing that bin Laden was there at the time. But, uh, there was about 300 madrasa leaders out there, and none of whom had ever seen a Westerner before. And at one point, it got really dicey. I mean, there was a lot of shouting going on, and it looked like it was bordering on violence, you know. But um, um, one of the things I found, I don't know why it happens, but when I get in those situations, I don't get angry, and I don't get heated. I get very cool and calm. And, and, and that helps disarm things. It also helped to have our Wahhabi partner there who shouted them down <laughs> as well. <laughs> so, so it, uh, you know, you, you get in these, but, but I really suggest that at least 80% of the credit for our success goes to the project leader we had. I told somebody, someone, I said, you know, if I were God and I were trying to design somebody perfect for this physician, a madrasa project leader. I said, I couldn't have done as well. And the person looked at me and says, but he did. <laughs> I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, so anyway, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Prioritize, because a lot of the issues are so interwoven. 
Uh, that's a very good question. Not had it before. That's the last question. Okay. So if I understood, I wasn't quite sure I heard it all, but how do we prioritize what we do when we go in? Yeah. No, and it's a good question because uh, one of the things I would tell you that is that no two conflict situations are alike. Everyone is unique. They're driven by different personalities, circumstances. So. So there's no cookie cutter approach to what you do. And what we try to do is we try to do what is strategically going to be most effective. You know, our NGO is not about education. You know, we're not, you know, we're not educators. But, you know, we saw that, you know, that, that these madrasas were key to what's going on. It's where the extremists are getting their recruits. And you find that these youngsters who have memorized the Quran from cover to cover, uh, when approached by a militant to be recruited to their cause, they've got no ability to challenge or to question. Um, and uh, that was one of the other emphasis besides the uh, curriculum reform, was we changed the pedagogy to create critical thinking skills among the students. And you know, we're born with it in the West, but in these tradition-bound tribal cultures, there's just not a lot of room for creative thinking, but they need it. I say they memorize the Quran, but they don't know what it says. They have to memorize it in Arabic, and their language is Urdu. So it isn't until years later they get enough Arabic to be able to understand what it was about. So, so that in Pakistan made the most sense. In Sudan, uh, we had a, and that's a very grassroots, bottom-up approach. In Sudan, we used a top-down approach where we deliberately went in to establish relationships of trust with the regime to inspire them to take uh, steps toward peace they wouldn't otherwise take. And that really worked. Uh, lessons learned out of that when you're doing a top-down approach, make sure you look very hard and deal with the second and third tiers as well. Because whenever we left town, things would come to a screeching halt because they felt that whatever we were doing was going to be at their expense enhancing the Christians versus the Muslims, you know, so, so uh, it took us probably twice as long to achieve our goals there. So we, you, you sort of have to use your, use your head, your common sense as to what's going to make the most sense. In the business with the madrasas, then you have to prioritize what do these madrasa leaders need to learn. And a lot, uh, and the starting point for a lot of them was child psychology. How do you, how do you teach a child effectively to get them to want to learn. And fortunately, Ozzy was a real pro at that and uh, had done a lot of that before. And uh, it would sometimes bring tears to the eyes of the madrasa leaders who remembered when they were students being chained or beaten because they weren't memorizing the Quran fast enough. So it's, uh, you just have to, I think, have good common sense and and a good assessment of the problem, but be very careful about who you bring on as partners. You know? But I think that's about the best I can do. So I guess we've run out of time, but I'm happy to talk to any of you as you wish. Thanks.